bisa Seiu aku Jesus Seiu aku Jesus Somebody help me sing and say it's good, come on something in our life and point us in the right direction we ask that your spirit guide us in jesus name amen hallelujah praise the lord yeah. hallelujah oh, we are blessed and we thank god for this opportunity today and whenever i get the opportunity to come on gps during the week i call it a blessing I don't know about anybody, but for me, I take it that God shifts something in my week. Hallelujah. Because Amen. my week is my week is organized a certain way that mm. I sleep at certain times and I wake up a certain time. But when God gives you a command, they say, I need you to show up at this particular time. Mm -hmm. I know that God is trying to change something in my life. Mm. He's trying to change the course of the week or the course of the month. Hallelujah. Amen. So without taking too much time let's take a quick look at matthew chapter 26 matthew 26 
verse 40 to 43. Today we are teaching, so we're going to pray, but we have to teach. Understand that God wants to do something to prepare us. Hallelujah. Matthew 26, verse 40 to 43. The Bible says, Then he returned to his disciples and find them sleeping. Could you, couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed. My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time saying the same thing. Then verse 45, then he returned to the disciple and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayal. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. I want to explain something that um, we take for granted some time in the body of Christ and don't deal with it or neglect to deal with it is to break away from the flesh is to just look at one aspect of the Christian life and not walk into the victorious life that Christ has promised us. A lot of time we focus either too much on the spirit, neglect the soul and neglect the flesh, but the body or the human being is not just the spirit. We are body, soul, and spirit. So it's great to have the Spirit of God, but the Spirit of God dwell in the flesh that is corrupted. So if the flesh is not dealt with, guess where the enemy comes from to attack us? He doesn't attack your spirit. The devil knows better not to attack our spirit because when we pray and fast, the spirit is heightened. It is on alert. It is sharp. But guess where your weakness is? Is in your flesh and is in your blood. Every time the devil succeeds in something, is in the flesh. It's never in the spirit. That's what Jesus said. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The disciples wanted to pray, but they couldn't pray because their flesh was weak. So we established that first. We are in the last two weeks before Pentecost where we are supposed to be clothed with the Holy Spirit. It's a reminder, a memorial. So it's important for us to grasp the concept of the Holy Spirit, but also to understand the fullness of God in our life. Somebody go with me real quick to Acts chapter one, Acts chapter one, verse four to five. It says, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them these commands. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The key word here is baptism. Jesus says that, in a few days, you are going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I'm stressing this one real quick. We all understand that baptizo means to immerse someone deeply in the water, to dip them in the water, to bury them in the water so that they can rise up with Christ. So what happened when we go and get baptized in the Holy Spirit? Everybody knows the scriptures. We also have to be deep in there. So what is dying when we get baptized with the Holy Spirit? All of our pride, all of our control, everything that we think makes us, we have to relinquish that and say that there's no one else who is in charge but the Spirit of God in my life. I'm not even in charge. 
God is in charge. But the thing is, people say, I have the spirit of God, but they still want to lead the light. They don't want God to guide them. It's so difficult. We have picked up some habits in our lives and we do things not understanding that as long as the flesh doesn't die, you are still influenced by the things that you come from. And it's in your blood and it's in your flesh. Look at this. Luke 24, Luke chapter 24, verse 45 to 49, it says something about being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then Jesus, he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been what? Clothed with power from on high. So the baptism of the spirit is a new spiritual garment that you get, but you can't get it until you are fully clothed from head to toes. But for you to be clothed, you have to be under, inside of that cloud and be baptized. Now, unfortunately, we have seen people full of the spirit of God, but we were broke. Doesn't make sense. You can raise the dead. You can do all of this thing. And then guess what? You are sick in your body. Mm -hmm. You can heal the sick, but you yourself, you have a sickness in your body. There's a problem. You can do all those things. So that means that there is something in your life that you have not dealt with. There is something in your life that you have not allowed God to deal with. I give you a simple example for us to illustrate this. If you look at 2 Kings chapter 4, 2 Kings chapter 4 from verse 1, I'm kind of going slow here for us to see. It's talking about anointing, talking about something. Verse 1 says, The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as a slave. Let me pause right there. Listen to what she says. She says that her husband was a prophet and he revered God. He feared God and served God faithfully. But how and why does he die broke? Mm as a prophet, to the point that they want to enslave his children to pay the debt. With all that anointing, he prayed for everybody, but he died in debt. Something in his life was not dealt with. Full of the spirit, but cannot manifest the spirit in the flesh and in the blood. It took Elijah, who had the secret of the anointing, to ask the wife, what do you have at home? She said, your servant has nothing except a small bottle, a small jar of olive oil. What she calls small, God said, the anointing is more important than anything else. He said, go borrow from your neighbor's vessels, lock yourself in your room, pour the oil. When she finished, he says, sell the oil, pay off your debt, and leave on the rest of it. Financial freedom came because of the anointing, not because she worked. So it means that when we don't understand spiritual principle, we go out trying to work hard and work hard and work hard, but not understanding that we have to operate in the spiritual realm when we want to break away from debt. Some folks have been trying to use what they call it, um, debt counseling 
all of this. It's been 10 years. Your credit score has now moved. <laughs> it goes up, it comes down. It goes up, yeah. it comes down. So that means that the devil is attacking something in your bloodline mm. that deals with wealth. If that doesn't awake you and make you pray <laughs> and you accept it, it's not God's fault because God already told you the area where the enemy attacks. Mm. It's as simple as that. Look at your life and see where the attack comes. He cannot attack your spirit, but what that does to you, it discourages you and makes you feel like there's no hope. You've tried so much. So now you stop fighting. You just leave. Leave. You pray, you pray. Ba, 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 but you're in there. The Bible says, oh, no man, nothing except love. You're so broke and in debt, you can't even give people love because your spirit is down. Even your prayer change, beggar's prayer, all you ask is material things because of your condition. That means you don't understand. See, we have to be clothed with the spirit of God. Now, I want to show you something very good. For us to deal with the flesh, we have to address two things, the body and the blood. Listen, when God called Abraham, he knew one thing about Abraham, that Abraham's father was what? An idolater. Let me hear somebody out. Joshua chapter 24, verse 2 to 3. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in all time. Even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nacor, and the served out of gods. That's an idolatry. So how do you want to use someone whose father has lived 135 years in the place and has been showing you what he knows? I didn't get this number by mistake. <laughs> Look at Genesis 11. Genesis 11, 31. The Bible says, Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. Listen where they were going. But when they came to Aran, they settled there. The goal was to go to Canaan, but they never arrived there. Terah lived 205 years and he died in Aran. He has his child, Abraham, at age 70. He died at 205. That's 135 years. So for 135 years, all you've been shown is idolatry. The only way God can take you out of there is to separate you from your father's house. That's what God told him, leave, leave. The Lord said to Abraham, go from your country. Genesis 12, 1, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. There needs to be a separation. I'm going to say this one thing that sometimes we do out of ignorance. I don't know about everybody's culture, but I come from a culture that came from Ghana. Um, we are the Akan group. We are in Zima. So we came and migrated to the Ivory Coast, but we took some culture with us. And there's something that they do. They, when a child is born, whether it be a boy or a girl, they make a small figurine, a statue, and then they make a covenant and say that that statue represents the husband or the wife of the baby. Mm. Are you listening to me? Mm -hmm. That is baffling me that a child who was born has no will. Someone out of tradition decide to marry them with a spirit. 
And then they have night husband, wife husband, and they grow up and they wonder why their life is messed up. Unless somebody give God the revelation to a servant, a woman of God, to say, hey, in your culture, this is what they do. To break away from this, we will try, try, try. The person goes up and down. But we don't know that there's something to deal with the tradition. We don't know. But when God, it, you yourself, God may reveal this to you because they won't tell you. They pour some blood, spoke some things on it. It makes no sense. That's idolatry. The tying people with spirit. Listen. <laughs> Let me break this down and we're going to move on. We're going to take two examples of people who cannot deal with the flesh. And we see what happened to them. First one is Moses. Anybody know the tribe of Moses, where Moses' tribe came from? What is this tribe? The tribe of Levi. Okay. What did Jacob say concerning Levi, his son? Genesis chapter 49, verse 5 to 7. Genesis 49, the Bible says, Simeon and Levi. Genesis 49, verse 5. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter the council. Let me not join the assembly for they, shall, they have killed men in what? In the anger. Their anger. And hamstrung oxen as they please. Cursed be their anger. So fierce and their fury so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. That's Simeon and Levi. If you don't know the story, their sister was raped. And then they decided to go to Shechem and make a covenant with the people of Shechem and trick them because the prince of Shechem took their sister and raped her at dinner. They asked them to circumcise themselves, knowing that for three days they will be weak. And guess what? They kill all of them. So that's why Jacob says, out of anger, this is what they did. So the tribe of Levi has one problem, is anger. And Jacob spoke against it. So if you don't deal with anger, guess what's going to happen? Anger will disqualify you. Mm. Okay. The woman of God, I listen when people pray. She's, Pastor V was praying earlier. She said, Let's, that spirit of anger. She says something. I know somebody caught that. She said that spirit of anger. Listen, <clears throat> people who have anger in their lives and it stays there, if you have identified, if you joke around, don't pray against it. Don't ask God to set you free from it. You will see what anger will do. So Moses is right from the tribe of Levi. Guess how Moses gets disqualified from entering Canaan? It's because of anger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Full of the Spirit of God. A man who saw God face to face in the burning bush. Mm -hmm. Talked with God. And the Bible says, it says, If there be a prophet amongst you, I speak to them through visions and I reveal myself to them through dreams. But with Moses, it is not so. I speak to him face to face as a man speak with his friend. And mm. that man get disqualified for entering Canaan. Not because he's not anointed. Not because he doesn't perform miracle. Simply because something in his life was not dealt with. And it dealt with his bloodline and his flesh. Anger. That's all. Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. Look at this. Verse 9. Num Numbers chapter 20, verse 9. It says, So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence just as he commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock. And Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels. You know, somebody calls you rebels, whatever comes after that is not nice. Nah. They're about to say something or do something that's out of character. 
He said, listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out and the community and the livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. Because of anger. Disqualify. Right away. If you don't know what that thing, how important this is, what God said is that I want to show you revelation upon revelation, precept upon precept. First Corinthians chapter 10. Let's look at what that rock was or who that rock was or is. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. We are going to be baptized into the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit. They were baptized into Moses and into the cloud. If you knew what the cloud was, they say whenever the people of Israel would go to the tent of meeting, a cloud will cover the tent. So it was the presence of God, the Shekinah of God. His spirit will come down and all the Israel will wait. So there was a shadow of the Holy Spirit. But the Bible said everyone that crossed the Red Sea were baptized into Moses and what? In the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For the drink from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Mm. So Moses struck Jesus in the wilderness mm. out of anger. Do you know when you were supposed to receive 40 lashes, they would do 40 minus one, so you received 39. They would call that the coup de grace, meaning that you were spared one so that you don't die. Moses already gave the 40th strike to Jesus out of what? Out of anger. So anger in his bloodline dealt with him. Could not make it to the promised land. But yet full of the Holy Spirit, yet full of power, yet doing miracles. Something has not been dealt with. Let me give you the second person. Saul, King Saul. So if you know the same Genesis 49 talks to us about the first man that became king. Saul is from the tribe of Benjamin, not Judah. Look at Genesis 49 verse 27. I'm making a point. Mm -hmm. Genesis 49 verse 27. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. He's not a lion. So I don't care what you do. Wolf nature was in the family of Saul, not Judah. But God said that he that will sit on that throne must be what? From the tribe of the lion of Judah. So the people wanted a king, but God warned them. He said, what you're asking for is out of season. What you're asking for is not in the right bloodline. They said, we don't care. We still want a king. He said, okay, I'll give you some. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, he devours the prey. In the evening, he divides the plunder. Guess what King Saul did? God told them in 1 Samuel chapter 8 from verse 9. He said, time to tell them what kind of king they're getting. Just tell them what he would do. He said, now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over there will claim as his right. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people. We were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his right. He will take your sons 
and make them serve with his chariot and horses. And they will run in front of his chariot. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousand and commanders of fifty, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariot. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He would take the best of your field and vineyard and olive groves and give them to his attendant. He will rob you like the devil. He said, He comes, the wolf comes to other, he comes to do what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. He would take the best of your field and vineyard. He would take a tenth of your grave. He, now he's substituting himself as God, he's taking the tithe. Mm. The covenant with God for wealth. The king took it. And you want to prosper. But you are so blinded by your emotions and what you want, you're willing to compromise and accept anything because that's what you want. He said, give it to them. So when you see this, when you look at Saul of Tarsus, He's a descendant of King Saul because he's also a Benjamite. And guess what he did? The same way King Saul persecuted David is the same way Saul of Tarsus persecuted Jesus before he got saved. It was in his bloodline. That's as simple as that. <laughs> Listen. When you see Acts chapter 9 verse 4, Jesus said to Saul of Tarsus, he said, he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who's the me? It's Jesus. But who's, Jesus was not there. So when he said you persecute me, he's talking about his body, the church. Let me help you out. So the reason why, let's take a look at this. God said that Saul was going to be anointed as captain, but functioning as a king. Let me take the King James Version on this one, because sometimes the version translated as ruler. 1 Samuel 9, 16. We're going somewhere. We got to deal with some things here. Tomorrow. 1 Samuel 9, chapter, chapter 9, verse 16. Tomorrow about this time, I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be what? Captain over my people Israel. Okay, switch. 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. Look at this. And the Lord said to Samuel, the same man, How long will thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel, fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Not a captain, but a king. Because the real king has to come from the line of Judah. You have established this. So I got about seven minutes or so, or ten, and we're going to pray. Why did Jesus give his blood and his body to the disciple and told us to make this a memorial? See, the spirit deals with the spirit, the flesh deals with the flesh, and the soul deals with the soul. Not understanding the three dimension is what Christians are busted. Let me hear me out. The role of the body, when he gives us communion, he say, eat my flesh. Look at this. I love, I love the Bible so much. He say, eat my flesh. If you look at John 6, I want you to see this. John 6. Let me pull this up real quick. We go into verse 35. John 6, 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever come to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. 
But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me. And whosoever comes to me will never, I will never drive away. He said, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I shall lose none of all those he has given me. Okay. So, John, verse 53. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Life is two ways. is in the body, but is also in the blood. You see, whoever eat my flesh and drink my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them at the last day. To the point that these people did not understand what Jesus is talking about. So I want to move forward real quick. The body deals with the body. The spirit deals with the spirit, and then the soul deals with the soul. Let's make this plain. It says, Isaiah 53, verse 5, everybody quote this. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. The wounds were not in the soul. They were not in the spirit. They was in his flesh. So the wounds of Jesus heals your body. So when you take communion, he heals your body. That's what the apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He said, when you don't discern the body of the Lord Jesus Christ and you take it unworthily, that is the reason why many of you are sick. Sickness is in the body. They say you're sick. Okay. So we know when we pray, when we quote Isaiah 53, 5, we're asking for healing on the principle that his body that was broken for us has provided healing. So there's no reason why I should be saved and be sick. Mm. Nah. He already gave his body, broke it for me, for me to be healed. So if I understand that, when sickness shows up, I said, do you know that there's something that was done on the cross of Calvary where Christ's body was broken? You are the wrong address, move. Try somewhere else. But when you don't know, you go see the doctor and you accept it. Mm -hmm. Listen to this. Blood deals with the soul. Leviticus 17 verse 11. Leviticus 17 verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Let me say it again. Listen how God puts those two words together. The life of the flesh is in what? The blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. The other version say for your life. When you go to the King James Version, it says for your soul. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Almost all things are cleansed with the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So blood comes to deal with sin. That's what we're talking about, sins of the fathers, curses and so when the blood of Jesus is introduced in your life guess what it treats your bloodline and every curses that was attached to it that's what it does but unfortunately some people have the tools but they don't use it it's the worst thing that can ever happen to a Christian I'll give you a short story before we close out there's a rich man when his son turned 18 he bought him an exotic cause Understand this. I didn't say a luxurious car. I didn't say an expensive car. Exotic car means that it is unique. That car was over $250,000 for an 18-year-old boy. He placed the key into a Bible, called the son into his home office. He said, son, happy birthday. Handed him the Bible. The son took the Bible and threw it away. He said, with all your money, you could not give me a better gift on my 18th birthday. Mm -hmm. So it's a Bible you give me. He said, watch, I will succeed without you. And he left. 20 years later, the father died. The son made it. 
some kind of way. He did okay for himself. So he came home for the funeral and went into the father's office. And the father left the Bible on his desk for 20 years. The son looked at the Bible and opened it and the key fell. So he was kind of baffled. So he looked at the address, drives over there and asked, is there a car that is attached, connected to this key? They said, oh yeah, a rich man bought it 20 years ago for his son, but no one came to claim it. Because the gift was now wrapped into nice paper, gift paper, because it didn't have a bow on it. Some of us, they buy a vehicle for their wives and wherever, and they put a bow on it, deliver on the driveway, they're happy. But how about the one that comes in the passage that you don't know? It's a Bible. I'm just trying to tell someone, there's so much gift inside of the Bible, but unless you open it, you won't find the key to life. That young man cried, regretted how he missed 20 years of his life and relationship with his father, all of this out of anger because his eyes could not see what the father was doing. He was giving him more than a car. He was giving him a car to tell him that prophetically, I'm giving you keys to go from one point to your destiny, but he's stuck into the Bible principle. But he threw it away. Now you're crying, it's over, it's been gone. 20 years wasted out of ignorance but it's in the Bible. See, let me go there. The Last Supper, all of us remember, before we even talk about Pentecost, because we have one more week. The Last Supper. So next week, we're going to talk about Pentecost, the Holy Spirit. I'm doing you an introduction so your body can be ready, that you're not just full of the Holy Spirit, but you are a triune man, complete, with body, mind, and soul. Operate full gear. Busted. Jesus finished washing the disciples. He didn't come. And guess what happened right after that? Luke chapter 24, verse 31 to 34. Luke 24, 31 to 34. He said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to see all of you as wheat. These are the people who just took communion. And the devil is claiming a right on them. He said, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. What claim does the devil has? He said, you folks, you just took communion. The only reason why he shows up and asks for them because the blood is being dealt with. The flesh is being dealt with. So it's the last attempt to try and derail them. That's what Jesus said, I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail you. Last one. Jude 9. Jude 9, you know, it's only one chapter. It's another Jude chapter 1, whatever. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Okay. That's saying Moses again. Why would the devil fight the archangel Michael to take the body of Moses? I know some of you read that. He's claiming something. He said, this thing belonged to us. Michael said, no, it doesn't belong to you. Because Christ has died. Their body don't belong to you. You can't do whatever you want to do. Michael came down from heaven to fight the devil because he's trying to take the body of Moses. The same way the devil is attacking churches, he's trying to claim churches, the body of Christ. It's not yours. Mm. So that means that there's something in the church that we're not dealing with that is giving him a right to say, I have my own in there. And that's why sometimes you see that the body of Christ has issue. Jealousy, this pastor with that pastor, this one put stumbling blocks in another one, don't want this one to succeed, this and that. Why? It's in the flesh. 
we're going to stop here today, but we're going to pray. We got two minutes, and then I'll render the mic. If you pray this prayer, you're going to pray against every reclamation of your flesh and every reclamation of bloodline because Christ has already given us his broken body and his blood. He said the new covenant, the blood of the new covenant. So nothing else has claim over you. Let's lift up our voices. We've got two minutes. Let's just pray for two minutes against it. In the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we lift up our voices and condemn every reclamation of the devil in our flesh, from our bloodline, in the name of Jesus. Father, cancel everything that is anger in our lives, everything that is an open door. Father God, we seal it this morning in the name of Jesus. We seal it this morning in the name of Jesus. Even things unknown that we do not know, Father God, we declare it in the name of Jesus that Christ has died and paid the price for us, that we are the body of Christ. And Father God, he has no power over us. We declare that we have no with Christ. We declare that we have identified with his death. We have crucified we have crucified the flesh in the name of Jesus. We have crucified the flesh. We are buried with Christ in the name of Jesus. And those we are buried with Christ, we rise up with new life. Father, we declare new life in the name of Jesus. We declare new life this morning in the name of Jesus. We are dealing with the flesh and with the dealing with it, and we declare that it is over in the name of Jesus. Your spirit is greater, oh God. Your spirit and your blood are cut us away from the bloodline. Renew our DNA. Change everything that is a bloodline that will claim anything against us in the name of Jesus. We declare that flesh has died. Father, not that we have died, but we claim it that it's dead. But every flesh that did not die, Father, we choose to fire today. Every area, aspect of our life that could be an open door, we crucify it today in the name of Jesus. We declare it is crucified in the name of Jesus. Declaring crucified. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. We declare it done. We crucify in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, blessed be your holy name. In the name of Hallelujah, mm. hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. It looks like you guys weren't praying. <laughs> hallelujah. Listen, listen. Um, I need, I, I'm, I'm going to break. Give me five minutes of your time, please. We'll give announcement, five minutes. But take this prayer very seriously. Hallelujah. Thank you, man of God. God bless you. Hallelujah. I'm going to break down what Pastor Serge said in, 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 in a language we all understand because when he was talking i was writing down the things that that beset us pain unforgiveness bitterness anger envy jealousy the pride of life the last of the eye the last of the flesh hallelujah but i want us to um uh, can we put up we're going to confess this galatians 2 20 I am crucified with Christ. <laughs> Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Live and the life me. which I now Hallelujah. live in the flesh, I flesh live by the faith of, of God, of the Son of God, who <laughs> Hallelujah. I need you to declare this. This is your prayer this morning. Hallelujah. Whatever that is besetting you, whatever that is, uh, is so heavy, whatever it is, anger, jealousy, 
pain, envy, unforgiveness, pain. So I need you to declare this this morning. Hallelujah. Declare this this morning as we leave I say, I am. Can we all read this? Confession. I am crucified with Christ. And flesh crucified with Christ. That flesh is crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet. Somebody pray this prayer this morning before you leave this altar. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, a Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself to me. You, we will not be accused by the brethren, but the accuser of the brethren, that makes you feel so guilty. Your help has come this morning. Season has come. My help has grown. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for this morning, oh God. Thank you for your help, Ebenezer. Thank you, thank you. In the name of Jesus. Thank you. And I'm so blessed this morning. Um, good for thoughts. Hallelujah. Thank you. you Just bear in mind that you live in Christ. Hallelujah. We are we are crucified with Christ in the name of Jesus. And the key to life, one thing, um, never forget the key to life is in the word. Hallelujah. I want you to declare it. The key to life is in the word. And who is the word? Christ, Christ Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. God bless everyone this morning. Hallelujah. You are all blessed this morning. I want to give the announcement. Next week, um, turning points, you do not want to miss. Uh, if we can project that in the name of Jesus, turning point, suffering, soaring, and surviving hell. And I think this is a great introduction even um, to that topic, hallelujah. Suffering and what, sowing and surviving hell, hallelujah. Please, please give, um, project the, um, uh, distribute or send this flyer all over, hallelujah. Amen, 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 amen. amen. Like everyone is so quiet hallelujah so mm. send it over and invite someone in the name of jesus you don't want to miss it 23rd as you see we're starting a new topic it's going to be um i think for four weeks um or five weeks so please please get yourself ready in the name of jesus also i want to um uh, admonish you to if you haven't gotten your devotional please please there are so many ways you can support this ministry. If you notice, we never ask to give. We never, never. But once in a while, we just have to remind you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you can give in so many ways if we can project that. And also you can get the devotion. Hallelujah. Amen. 
It's like everyone is quiet. Or is the music too loud? Amen. Talking in that word. Okay. Thank you. Mm. And hallelujah. Thank you, um, Minister Kaylee. Hallelujah. Mm. Mm. Everyone. So that is a way you can give to the ministry. Hallelujah. Amen. You always Amen. give where you, where you sow, where you eat. Hallelujah. God bless everyone um, this morning. I know you were blessed as I was. I want to welcome Sister Esther, Sister Joyce, hallelujah, and Sister Christina as well. God bless you. Amen. Thank you. I forgot to welcome you as well. Bless you, Mama Z. Bless you as well. Let's share the grace. We'll be um, today's um, Tuesday. Okay, Wednesday tomorrow. We're praying, um, fasting three times, meeting three times, morning, afternoon, evening. If you have any prayer, personal prayer request, please um, send it over for tomorrow afternoon and evening, and for Friday as well. God bless everyone. Let's share the grace. Hallelujah. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God in this place forevermore. Amen. Shirley, Shirley, Shirley. Just tell the next person that I am crucified with Christ, not I that live, but Christ with Christ. Yeah.